Hello and welcome to Music City Murder, a podcast meant to give people an insight into the history behind Nashville's most infamous murders. The show is hosted by author T. Blake Brady. You can find his novels at Parnassus Books in Green Hills, as well as on Amazon. Fans of James Lee Burke's Dave Robichaux series will probably dig these books, too. One last thing before we begin. If you like what you hear, be sure to rate and review Music City Murder on the Apple Podcasts app. It's the little purple icon on your phone. Reviews help to distinguish the show from millions of other podcasts out there. A five-star review is appreciated, but it doesn't matter what you say. No one is sure how it helps, but it definitely does. It has something to do with the algorithm, I think. Anyway, let's get on to the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As the intro says, you are listening to Music City Murder. This is the first episode of the third season of the show. I look forward to bringing you 10 more episodes of your favorite true crime stories right out of Nashville. I'm your host, Tyler, and with this episode, we're going to dive into a few ghost stories and urban legends from Middle Tennessee's long and sordid history. Most of these stories are apocryphal and therefore unprovable, but... They're all entertaining, and they took place right here in Nashville, around about there. So I'll try to give some history along with the haunts, if you catch my drift. I'm adapting these stories from a book called The Nashville Haunted Handbook. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And that said, let's get right into things. I'm a big fan of ghost stories. And all things spooky, Halloween is my favorite holiday. My mom was born on Halloween, and my son was born the day before Halloween. So, I hope you're as excited as I am. There's a graveyard just off Dyer Road called the Dyer Cemetery. And it's where our first tale comes from. Supposedly, or allegedly, what happened was... Three women in a nearby town were accused of being witches. I know this is a true crime podcast and not a movie show, but I absolutely cannot miss this opportunity to point something out. It's the exact beginning to the movie Hocus Pocus. I don't think my wife would let me get away with not stating the obvious there. And just a side note on witches... Nobody really knows when witches came into historical being. That said, one of the earliest records of witches was from the Bible, specifically the book of 1 Samuel. It tells the story of a medium enlisted to help summon the dead prophet Samuel's spirit to defeat the Philistine army. The witch did what they asked, but when Samuel's spirit appeared, it prophesied the death of Saul and his sons. That all happened, and Saul ended up committing suicide. It's a bummer, I know. So, this very Shakespearean tale sets the template for most narratives we have surrounding the existence of witches. I hate to make another reference here, but it's the earliest version of a Faustian bargain as well. Just getting all your literature in there in one fell swoop. Anyway, the three women fled the town, but were followed by a mob which cornered them, hung them from a tree, and then burned their bodies before burying them in the graveyard. Supposedly. I mean, it's a horrible story, but it's also probably not true, like a good amount of local history from around that time. Though, there is a cemetery, and graves and everything, right where they say it is. So we can feel pretty good about Diving into the haunts and spooks surrounding it. The haunting itself begins at the gate, even before you get into the cemetery. Apparently, the gate is quite rusted and is difficult to open. Yet some people report having the gate swing open on its own. 
Okay, not exactly the Amityville Horror, but things get a little bit more spooky here in a moment. Visitors say that upon entering, they are sometimes approached by shadowy figures that rush toward them and then disappear. The sound of approaching footprints will be accompanied by, well, nothing at all, just the surrounding darkness. Even more creepy is the fact that there is a cedar tree right near the front of the cemetery where the witches were supposedly hanged. Near this tree, people will feel phantom hands tugging at their arms and legs and clothes and even their hair. Others get strange scratches down their arms, seemingly from the fingernails of long dead witches. Sometimes fireballs will appear near the tree and then vanish, leaving only the impression that historical horrors occurred there. Okay, fireballs. I have to give you a, a note on orbs at this point. Because I always, I think that a lot of times when we hear stories about ghosts, when we hear supernatural tales, I think we're expected just to note that, oh, if something appears, then it must be supernatural. Or we just have to assume that if it, this isn't normal, that somehow out of the the normal realm of things, the natural order of things. So here's, when we talk about fireballs and orbs, here is, I think, what most uh, paranormal investigators might be referring to. Orbs are often presented as evidence of the paranormal, perhaps the manifestation of souls long departed. Most of the time, they're reported in photos, appearing in frame even when people don't remember seeing them. So what are they? Experts disagree on the specifics, but they don't think it's actually a sign of paranormal activity. In photos, it's generally believed that the floating orbs are likely dust particles of some kind. Kinds that aren't visible to the naked eye. You see, the camera flashes often pick them up, even though human beings can't really see them. Now, the fact that these sightings are in person at the Dyer Cemetery and not on camera leaves me a little baffled. I think that very often people go into haunting situations and they're already credulous of what's going on. They think, that if something's supposed to be haunted, that anything that happens can be construed as a haunting. I mean, I've never seen a fireball at night, but I also don't know what the circumstances are surrounding these eyewitness accounts. I mean, we don't really have any video, just second and third hand accounts of things happening. And who's to say that these even represent hauntings of any kind? We naturally want to link one thing with another. Who's to say it's not, even if these things did appear, who's to say that they're not, you know, just weird gas balls? <laughs> you know, like that, that was uh, one of the rumors in my hometown was that there was a swamp nearby and that a railroad track ran next to it, as is often the case with uh swamps and railroads and things like that and there was a, a story of a beheaded trainsman of some kind an engineer or who knows what and so the rumor went that this beheaded man who lost his head somehow it was never really revealed um, fell asleep on the tracks who knows but that if you went to a certain portion of the swamp and waited there at midnight you would see a light going down the tracks. And it was supposed to represent the man looking for his head. He was holding a lamp looking for his head. And I believe that for most of my life, as I think most people do. We love to believe in superstitions. We love to believe in these tales that make us, you know, all goose fleshy. But the truth of the matter is that it probably comes from some sort of swamp gas and not uh, doesn't really have a supernatural beginning 
If you want to dispute that, that's I feel fine if you want to comment on the episode and tell me a story that you've experienced that's supernatural because I think ghost stories are super fun, even if I don't really believe in them. And so if you have your own ghost story, please feel free to contact the, uh, the podcast, okay? And let me know what's going on with your supernatural events because I, I, love, I love ghost encounters. Okay, so that's the Dyer Cemetery Witch Haunting. And if you want to visit the cemetery from Nashville, take I-24 East for about 23 miles to exit 74A. 840 West, take uh, 840 West towards Franklin. So it's over near Franklin. Follow this road for a little more than two miles to exit 50 toward Beasley Road. That's B-E-E-S-L-E-Y. And then turn left at the end of the exit ramp on the Veterans Parkway. After another two miles, turn right onto Franklin Road. Take your second left onto Kingwood Lane. Follow Kingwood Lane for another two and a half miles before turning right onto Windrow Road. And follow that road for three miles before angling right onto South Windrow Road. After another mile, turn right onto Dyer Road. And the cemetery is near the end of Dyer Road. It's a, an appropriate name, don't you think? Dyer Road. D Y E R. So that's the Dyer Road Cemetery Witch Haunting. Okay, moving on to another cemetery in the area. Let's check out the Pegram County Cemetery in nearby Cheatham. I'll just say this up front. If you were looking to visit all the places, Uh, mentioned in this episode stop here the Pegram Cemetery doesn't officially exist anymore so your ghost tour would reach a dead end right there anyway the Pegram Cemetery was located on the edge of the Harpeth River on a plot of land that abuts Nashville by the 1970s the cemetery had become somewhat dilapidated and a group of folks hired some developers to raise the land. R-A-Z-E, raise. They did just that, and they built some houses on concrete slabs on the spot where the cemetery used to be. The dirt that they dug up, well, they sold it to places all over the county, a fact which will come up later. Five years after this, the Harpeth River rose 30 feet, During a flood, a coffin emerged from the muck of the Pegram Cemetery. Horrifying idea, by the way. The coffin belonged to one Carrie Pegram Heath, who had died in January of 1953, some 20 years earlier. For those of you looking for some kind of grand horror tale, There was nothing suspicious about Miss Heath's death. That is, except for the fact that her body ended up in somebody's front yard two two decades after she expired. As it turned out, the developers had not taken care of the land as they had excavated things and reburied the bodies. The resulting mix-up, and I think it's charitable to call it that, caused the company to incur a $500,000 fine, and they had to rebury Miss Pegram Heath. And if you think that cemeteries accidentally being unearthed at constructions is a rare occurrence, think again. I was able to find a multitude of stories about this very topic with a pretty simple Google search. One of the most famous cases comes from New York City Back just 1991, just 30 years ago, when crews constructing a federal office building revealed a colonial area era burial ground in Lower Manhattan. The graves, some dating back to the 1690s, had been lost to landfill development. But they were ID'd as part of the African burial grounds that in the 17th century were located just outside the city. Because they were banned from white cemeteries, free and enslaved African Americans had established a place to give respect to their dead, 
with an estimated 10 to 20,000 burials there. Coincidentally, by the Revolutionary War, Africans and African Americans made up almost 25% of the city's population. The city closed the graveyard in 1794, and in 1846, the nation's first department store, A.T. Stewart's, was opened on the spot. In 1897, 50 years later, when a home was demolished to make way for another business, a large number of human bones were found. However, most concluded that the bones' existence was the result of a lynching incident from 1741, in which 13 African Americans were burned at the stake and another 18 were hanged. Therefore, Nobody paid much attention, and no attempt was made to preserve the burial site. This place in New York City is the largest colonial-era cemetery for people of African descent, and it was originally known as the Negro's Burial Ground. It has been called, quote, the most important historic urban archaeological project in the United States, end quote. Thanks to some much-needed activism, The site is now commemorated with the African Burial Ground National Movement. It was designated a historic landmark in 1993 and a national monument in 2006 by then POTUS, George W. Bush. Imagine that. Imagine the disregard that must be felt in order to ignore the dignity of the dead. And that goes for both cases here. I don't know how much I believe in the supernatural elements related to disturbing a graveyard, but I certainly understand the superstition surrounding it. The most disrespectful thing you can do is harm a person's final resting place, I think. And this case, another case, isn't quite the same thing, but I feel compelled to include it for some reason. One of my favorite movies growing up, and I think some of you may know where I'm going with this, was Toby Hooper's, or as some might say, Steven Spielberg's 1982 horror flick, Poltergeist. There's plenty to be horrified about regarding the movie. People with chorophobia, fear of clowns, beware. But one thing sticks out. There is a scene in which the mom in the movie, played by Jo Beth Williams, is dragged into the pool by a supernatural force called the Beast. She manages to escape, but not before she runs into the skeletons of bodies buried under the home they had just purchased. Williams spent over four days filming this scene, in which she had to slop around in all kinds of mud and muck with the props of these skeletons and dead bodies. The whole time, she assumed they were made of rubber or plastic or something like that, but she later came to realize that they were, in fact, real, actual skeletons. There's a lot of speculation and recriminations around this particular point, but A deposition surrounding the movie's script reveals that the skeletons used in the film were, in fact, real. I'm totally pulling all of this from Snopes, but the following is a series of details that are pretty interesting nonetheless. Toby Hooper died in 2017, R.I.P. Mr. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but Bruce Casson, the movie's assistant prop master, said, quote, They came from Carolina Biological. Casson said, naming a medical and science supply company that sold human skeletons mainly for use in medical schools back in the 80s. Replicate skeletons did not exist as far as as I remember at the time. They're now common and relatively cheap. End quote. Here's the thing, though. Casson's IMDb page does not list Poltergeist as one of his credits. So the plot thickens. However, makeup artist... Craig Reardon said under oath that they were real. Here is his testimony. Quote, I acquired a number of actual biological surgical skeletons 
and surgical skeletons is what they're called. They're for hanging in classrooms for study. These are actual skeletons from people. I think they're bones acquired from India. But at any rate, we got 13 of these. And we dressed them so that they looked not like bleached, cleaned, bolted together skeletons, but instead disintegrating cadavers. End quote. There's a lot tangled up in that, but it is no surprise to know that there were companies in the early 1980s selling real human skeletons. So that's just a brief history of what I know about uh, incidental unburials. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of worked the poltergeist story into this podcast apropos of nothing. But, hey, I hope you learned something from it. Now, back to the saga of Carrie Pegram Heath. The last we saw her, she was reburied after floating into a random front yard after a 1970s something flood. You'd think we'd be done with her, right? Very rarely, if ever, does a dead person resurface more than once. And if you thought that, you'd be wrong. It happened again. You see, in 2010, there was a monumental flood in Nashville. A 1,000-year flood, an epic flood, a biblical flood. One that piled 19 inches of rain on Nashville and surrounding areas over the course of May 1st and May 2nd. To put things into perspective, Nashville receives about 50 inches of rain annually, so this was a little less than half of that over the course of two days. And man, was it catastrophic. If you actually lived in Nashville back then, and chances are you didn't, then you probably remember how terrible it was. At least 30 counties in Tennessee were declared major disaster areas by the federal government, with 52 applying for disaster status. That meant that over 30% of Tennessee was de designated a major disaster area. The Cumberland River crested at nearly 52 feet, a level not seen since 1937, before the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers flood me measures were put into place. Flooding on the Cumberland damaged the Grand Old Opry, the Gaylord Opryland Resort, the Opry Mills Mall, Bridgestone Arena, that's where the Nashville Predators play, and Nissan Stadium, where the Titans play. Now, for those of you who don't live in Nashville, it should be noted that the Grand Old Opry is not in Nashville proper. The resort is probably closer to the airport than it is downtown. It is its own beast, so it should probably be separated from everything else mentioned above. Okay, on to the unsettling part of the story. 21 deaths were recorded in Tennessee, including 10 in Davidson County, which is Nashville, alone. Of the 10 in Nashville, four victims were found in their home, two in cars and four outdoors. According to the Washington Post, Douglas Hammond, 65, was found dead in the Nashboro Village golf course. Nashville police said they believed he was swept away by high water after escaping from his vehicle, which had been run off the road and into a culvert. Gary Cole, 70, was found dead Sunday in his vehicle, a Honda sedan submerged in floodwaters from a creek near a Walmart, according to the police. Two people were found dead near a homeless camp in an area affected by flooding from Seven Mile Creek, police said. Frederick Richards, 64, was identified by police on Monday, and Melissa Conquest, 46, was identified by police on Wednesday after a police chaplain located and notified out-of-state family members. Seven Mile Creek, by the way, is down south of Brentwood, which probably means nothing to anyone not from Nashville, but... It's in a fairly affluent part of this region. Anyway, to come back around to the original to topic of conversation, during that momentous bout of flooding, Carrie Pegram Heath's body turned up in somebody else's yard. 
this time, they, I assuming the local government, just buried her right where she was found, behind a fence in the first house in the subdivision. Now, how did all of that lead to some paranormal activity? Well, let's get around to that. The town of Pegram has suffered some weird coincidences in the wake of Miss Carey's um, resurfacing. The subdivision built atop the cemetery was supposed to be floodproof, but there's been significant flooding at a number of the properties. Also, the local supermarket built in the vicinity burned down. There are other fires, apparently, but I can't find any hard and fast evidence of them, but apparently other things near there have burned down. I know. I know. It seems fairly underwhelming, but there's even been articles on News Channel 2 about the whole shebang, so it's not just some weird thing that gets said on a true, true, true crime podcast. I mean, it is that, but it's also a bigger deal than that. As far as the hauntings go, I can't find anything more specific than people get a creepy vibe from being in Pegram. And that kind of comment brings out my skeptical side. I wonder, if you took a poll of everyone who lived in Pegram, how many one would say that they got a creepy vibe? And how many would say that after you told them about the strange goings-on in the last few decades? It's a pretty thin charge, if you ask me. I mean, there is no specter in a sheet flying around and saying boo, so... Instead, I'll give just a brief history of recorded ghost sightings. The first one I can find comes from Roman historian Pliny the Younger, in which he argued that an old man with a long beard and rattling chains was haunting his home in Athens. It sounds exactly like the sort of thing you'd find in a Dickens novel. But that's the kernel from which most other ghost stories sprouted. Contemporaries uh, Lucian and Plautus also wrote their own ghost stories as well. And you can find an abbreviated version of Pliny's tale in his books. I'll spare you the details of that story, but it's the kind of story that we still hear today of someone moaning about death and rattling around and moving things, you know. A universal human experience, even from 2,000 years ago. Now, it's kind of an unsatisfying ending to a long and winding story, but for me, this tale is way more about the journey than the destination. I think that the history surrounding most of these events is far more telling about where we came from as a people um, then it is about hauntings and ghost sightings and the greed of human beings and the callousness of human beings is far more unsettling than fireballs or spooky sounds in the night. So on a scale of 1 to 10, this would probably rank a 2 or a 3, I guess. But it is a metaphor about the wages of greed any company that can misplace graves is doing it wrong. And not only do, do they deserve all the bad PR they can handle for such a callous move, maybe they do deserve a few scares too. This is all, I think, two stories that resonate with most people. Revenge and righteous indignation from the grave can be a heady brew. And it seems like we can live a little vicariously through people like Carrie Pegram Heath. And that will just about do it for this episode of Music City Murder, Season 3, Episode 1. Thank you guys for listening, and don't forget to support the show. If you've liked what you've heard, head on over to iTunes, give the show a 5-star review. If you're worried about what to say, don't. Just say you like the show. That's four words. I like the show. I don't personally care about the reviews, but every single one helps the show's analytics. I don't know. We also have a Patreon full of episodes not about Nashville. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Music City Murder to get started. Monthly subscriptions are just $1. 
For that, you can get access to all of the previous shows, as well as those coming up. I'm working on the final one or two episodes in the Richard Ramirez saga, and those should be posted soon. So thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next time on Music City Murder. Thank you.